Good morning. Hello, how's everybody doing? Fantastic. I'm Todd Park, US CTO, uh, and I'm incredibly fired up about the 2014 Energy Data Palooza. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, for those of you at your first Data Palooza, let me give you some background. The President has been committed to opening up government data to the public since his first day in office. Inspired by the success in decades past of opening up government weather data and GPS, actions that have spurred multi-billion dollar ecosystems of entrepreneurship, companies, and innovation, the Obama administration has been opening up data across a growing number of high priority areas in health, education, public safety, finance, global development, energy, and most recently in climate, we've been releasing and improving troves upon troves of valuable data that are previously hard to access or use. A year ago this month, the President issued a historic executive order and launched the administration's open data policy, making the new default for government information open and machine readable while continuing to rigorously protect privacy and security. Agencies are now cataloging their data resources and publishing lists of data that are or could be made public. Data is a valuable national asset that should be open and available to the public, to advocates, to entrepreneurs, to scientists, to innovators everywhere, instead of being trapped in government systems. Taxpayers paid for these vast troves of government data, and wherever possible, these information resources should be accessible in machine-readable form to everybody. But the President's open data initiatives aren't just about making government data available and liquid. They're also about collaborating with entrepreneurs and American innovators everywhere about the beneficial use of the data. In addition to traditional feedback mechanisms, we've also been engaging with the public with challenges, hackathons, and brainstorming sessions we call data jams. In fact, I see a lot of familiar faces here today from past energy data jams. And to highlight all this innovation, we've held summits like this, otherwise known as data palooza's. Open government data is fuel for all kinds of private sector innovation and economic growth. In fact, McKinsey recently estimated that open data can help unlock over $3 trillion of economic value per year, including over $580 billion in global value in the energy sector alone. And New York University recently put together a study of 500 representative companies that use open government data, including some of the companies here today. By leveraging freely available government data and tools, entrepreneurs and innovators are helping to build the clean energy economy. Innovations like those featured today here at the Energy Data Palooza can help Americans conserve energy, save money, and advance a safer and cleaner future. And I can think of no one better to talk about our energy and climate future than our next speaker. I'm pleased to introduce to you Counselor to the President, John Podesta. As many of you know, Mr. Podesta was Chief of Staff in the Clinton administration. Immediately prior to foregoing his retirement and re-entering government service, John was a nationally recognized voice as founder of the Center for American Progress, where he built CAP into a thought leader on the critical issues of our time. John now serves President Obama with a vital portfolio that spans big data and privacy, environment and climate issues, and of course, energy. John, we're absolutely thrilled to have you here. Thank you so much for your leadership and for taking the time to share your expertise with us. Please welcome John Podesta. Morning, everyone, uh, and thanks, Todd, for kicking things off and firing us up. We're, of course, blessed to have Todd as our fabulous CTO. On behalf of the White House and all of our federal partners, uh, I want to thank all of you for joining us today for the 2014 White House Energy Data Palooza. I actually got the word out. Uh, today, we're hearing about innovative data-driven tools that help make buildings more efficient, make our electric grid smarter, uh, and that accelerate the adoption of renewable energy solutions. I know you're all excited to hear today's speakers and see today's demos, uh, but I want to take a few minutes to put a context around this and talk about why these efforts are so important to President Obama and to the country. Climate change is real, it's driven by human activity, and it's happening right now. Earlier this month, the White House released the third National Climate Assessment which laid out in stark detail how climate change is already reshaping our country. Streets in Miami are beginning to flood, even on sunny days, because of sea level rise. Spring is coming earlier, heat waves are lasting longer, rainstorms are becoming deluges. That's why President Obama believes that we have a moral obligation to act now to curb climate change. 
He believes we have a responsibility to leave our, uh, uh, leave our children a planet that isn't damaged and degraded. That'll take a lot of work and uh, a lot of innovation. Last June, the White House released the President's Climate Action Plan, an ambitious and wide-ranging policy agenda to cut greenhouse gas emissions, drive international cooperation, and make our communities more resilient to the climate effects we won't be able to avoid. At the White House and across the administration, we're determined to execute that ambitious plan. We've created a strategy to reduce methane emissions from a wide range of activities and enacted standards limiting carbon pollution from new power plants. Just a few weeks ago, the President announced a huge series of commitments from the public and private sectors to deploy more distributed solar power and improve energy efficiency across millions of square feet of buildings, both public and private. We've started a task force of state, local, and tribal leaders to make recommendations on how we can boost resilience to climate impacts in local communities. Internationally, we've worked uh, to end public financing for new conventional coal plants overseas, except in the poorest countries, and other public credit agencies are taking up that call. Most recently, the ne Netherlands and the UK have joined the US uh, in that effort. And we're doing what the United States is best at, we're using data, we're promoting innovation, we're building technology to face this challenge head on. Back in March, we launched the Climate Data Initiative. That effort pairs open government data and ambitious federal challenges with private uh, and philanthropic commitments to develop user-friendly climate planning tools for local communities. The first release of climate data focused on coastal flooding and sea level rise and included more than 100 high quality data sets and tools for local communities and innovators. For the first time, mapping information about hundreds of thousands of infrastructures and uh, geophysical features across the United States was made public by the USGS, the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of uh, Defense, and the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. This data will be uh, crucial in helping communities plan for floods and other climate impacts. But the Climate uh, Data Initiative is about more than opening up government data. Those open data releases were amplified and made more powerful by partnerships with the private sector. As part of the first climate data initiative release, ESRI, the company that makes the uh, ArcGIS software used by thousands of city planners, pledged to leverage its platform to help communities better prepare for climate impacts. Intel pledged to host hackathons in New Orleans, San Jose, and Chesapeake Bay region. Google pledged to make huge amounts of cloud storage available to developers to house an experiment with climate data. Those are just three of um, more, more than dozen uh, of great uh, commitments from uh, uh, groups as diverse as Microsoft to the Rockefeller Foundation. And the climate data initiative won't stop there. The next set of data and commitments will be announced over the summer will focus on agriculture and food security. The power of data is something uh, else President Obama has long recognized as, as Todd noted. Recently, the President asked me to lead a 90-day review of big data to examine how new methods of data collection and analysis are reshaping our lives. The technologies underpinning big data from new methods of collection through sensors and other technologies to the declining cost of collection of storage and processing to per powerful new predictive analytics present important opportunities in virtually every sector of the economy. We, of course, must be vigilant about protecting personal privacy and other core American values in a world powered by big data, but we must also take advantage of these tools to fundamentally transform how we power our homes and businesses, how we manage our electric grid and our energy sources, and how we transport people around the country. That's what today is all about. Just as climate data will be essential to helping communities in the United States and around the world predict and prepare for future impacts of climate change, energy data can help us reduce the harmful emissions that are driving global climate change. The generation, transmission, uh, and distribution of electricity in the United States pr produce huge amounts of greenhouse gases. In 2012, the electricity sector was the single largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S., accounting for about a third of our total uh, emissions. That means effort like those on the agenda today, improving efficiency, deploying more renewable energy resources, and building a smarter electric grid are all essential to our efforts to reduce the threat posed by climate change. 
Climate change is a central environmental, economic, and security challenge of our time. Taking it on will require an all-hands-on-deck effort from the public and private sectors, from the American people, and from every nation on Earth. But looking around this room, I can't help but be optimistic. The challenges we face are serious, but so too is our commitment to innovation, to technological progress, to finding a better way, to proving that we can grow the economy, create jobs, and save the planet all at the same time. You know, history tends to repeat itself. Time and again, government is pressed forward to set standards to protect human health and the environment. Time and again, the same old suspects have said that the rules would destroy the American economy. Time and again, from the smallest startups to the largest corporations, we've proven those skeptics wrong. A few years ago, the Obama administration enacted the most stringent fuel economy standards in history and issued the first ever standards for heavy duty trucks. Those standards are expected to save consumers more than $1.7 trillion at the pump over the life of the program and reduce uh, projected carbon emissions by 6 billion metric tons uh, over the lifetime of those new vehicles. That's more carbon pollution than the U.S. emitted from all sectors in all of 2012. Last month, the EPA released an update of how uh, U.S. auto manufacturers were doing, and they found that not only had the auto industry met the targets, they had actually surpassed them by about 10 grams of CO2 per mile. And about 20%, 28% of the vehicles sold in 2013 met the most stringent greenhouse gas targets for 2016. That's why it's foolish to bet against American ingenuity. Maybe if the naysayers spent more time in rooms like this one, they'd come to realize that. Early next week, the EPA will announce proposed rules to limit for the first time carbon pollution from existing power plants. We already limit how much arsenic, mercury, and lead pollution these plants are allowed to release into the air we breathe. But power plants can release as much carbon as they want, and they do. Power plants are the largest single source contributor uh, to U.S. Gr greenhouse gas pollution, giving off fully, as I noted, one-third of our carbon emissions. I can't speak to the, uh, to the details of that proposal, which are under final review, but I can say that states will have significant flexibility to meet the standards using the energy sources that work best for each state. I can say that limiting carbon pollution from power plants will protect, will protect public health today and in the future. But to make this effort work, we're going to need uh, the innovation and the ingenuity that's in this room. All I can say uh, is that modernizing our power plants will continue our progress in cutting carbon pollution, spark homegrown clean energy innovation to create jobs, and lower energy waste to save families money. That's what this data palooza is all about, too. So thank you all for joining us today. Thank you for all that you do to help uh, as we transition to a world that is, that, uh, is using cleaner, more efficient uh, energy today and in the future. Thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Nick Sinai, a U.S. Deputy CTO, and I'm going to be the MC for the remainder of the morning. Uh, so we have a, a, a fantastic set of lightning presentations. Uh, from private sector and a few public sector uh, innovators and entrepreneurs. Really fantastic uh, morning we have planned. Uh, so without uh, further ado, let's just jump right into it. Uh, the first uh, speaker uh, is with a company called Nest. Uh, Nest, as many of you know, is really doing a, a tremendous job in pioneering a product category uh, that for so long has, has been a, uh, a staid category. Really exciting uh, story of, of innovation, of harnessing data in so many fantastic ways. Uh, so without further ado, uh, Ben Bixby. Great. I, I promised Nick I'd talk a little bit about uh, the history of Nest and data and where, wh what the future holds. And you know, I thought I'd start by uh, appropriating a, a slogan of uh, many of my colleagues' former employers. Uh, we, we, we think different at Nest. Uh, and as, as far as folks who get together to build thermostats go, we're, we're a different group. You know, we hail from Google, from Apple, from, from Tesla, from Twitter, from, from 
academia to uh, agencies to startups from coast to coast and, and, and around the world. And we've, we've all gotten together to build the, the conscious home, but, but more on that in a little bit. So we, we, we decided to tackle a problem in a product that hadn't seen meaningful innovation in, for decades, uh, the, the humble thermostat. Now, now I notice that uh, increasingly when I go to events like this, a number of the folks attending are maybe too young to remember what it's like to program a VCR. And well, you know, lo long after the VCR had given away to the DVR and to all manner of uh, internet dispatch of television, your thermostat just kind of sat there, you know, frozen, frozen in time, uh, locked into a 20th century interface that had, had never consistently yielded to the will of the masses. You know, research, experience, common sense all showed that the overwhelming majority of conventional programmable thermostats are, are just sitting on walls, severely suboptimally programmed if they're even programmed at all. Uh, you know, and as inventors and uh, purveyors of consumer electronics and as aficionados of the, the great Pixar film, uh, The Brave Little Toaster, it, it saddens all of us at Nest to see a product fail to fulfill its destiny. <laughs> and so we wanted to help the humble thermostat fulfill its destiny. And so we, we reimagined it. You know, we connected it. We gave it consciousness. You know, and now it, it, it's, it's all over the world. You know, uh, there are millions of Nest products out there, and they can be found in uh, over 90 countries. And that, that last statistic is uh, particularly remarkable when you consider that we only officially sell Nest in, you know, three countries. Uh, now, I'd, I'd say that the, the thermostat had become cool again, but I'm, I'm not completely sure that the thermostat was ever really originally cool in the first place. Uh, but now, you know, now you can even see hip outdoor advertisements for thermostats uh, on bus stops and in trendy neighborhoods. And you know, it's, it's this way that kind of the, the transformation becomes complete. You know, the humble thermostat is now a consumer product. It's, it's an object of desire. It's, it's something that makes your life better. Uh, you know, it's, it's not something that you, you need to program. It's something that, that, that programs itself. And so it makes the, the world better, the country better, and our economy stronger too. You know, you see that uh, Nest celebrates reinvention. We, we see things that are unloved and we, and we reinvent them. And of course, if you're in the business of reinventing unloved things, you have to start somewhere. And, and the world, you know, viewed through Nest's eyes and from the perspective of energy impact opportunities, steers straight to, straight to thermostats. You know, over 50% of the energy used in the home goes to heating and cooling the air. You know, how, how's that for a, for a data point? It means, it means uh, about $1,000 uh, a year for most folks and multiple thousands for many. You know, so, so let's delve deeper into that. It's data that drives the, the conscious home. Sensors on the inside, the internet from the outside. You know, this, is, uh, this is what your home looks like to your Nest thermostat. You know, this is how living your life automatically becomes Nest's remote control. You know, now Nest works whether it's connected to the internet or not. You know, Nest sets the, the standard, uh, we like to think, for, for what it means for a device to be a smart device. It's, it's onboard sensors feed, it's onboard microprocessor, and it makes informed and conscientious choices uh, just by you know, noticing you walked past, or by noticing your touch, or by noticing maybe that you, you haven't touched it in a while. You know, it's a device with intelligence baked in that continues to work for you, the consumer, or anybody else for that matter, uh, you know, e even if uh, none of you ever give Nest uh, another dime. You know, of course, remember, Nest is a giver. You know, the, the average home with Nest saves more than $179 each and every year on their energy bill. That's, that's meaningful money. You know, now this is uh, Nest nest in its own world, but like many things in life, it does get more fun with others. You know, as the administration succeeds in unlocking interval and rate data for customers and, and any consumer electronics providers that they may wish to connect with those data streams, uh, the whole experience gets even richer. You know, and, and you, the consumer, get richer too. Uh, you know, meter data such as that unlocked by the green button and related technologies make it ever more possible to, to precisely make the right choices you know, between comfort and conservation and at the right time. You know, and that's why we're, we're so excited uh, at Nest to be celebrating innovation and energy data together with you all today. You know, we, we can't wait to partner to add ever more informed consciousness to the home and to share in the, the cleaner, greener, and uh, stronger America that results. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure joining you today. Okay, uh, one quick logistical note I forgot to mention uh, where the hashtag for today is energy data. Uh, I know we don't have fantastic reception uh, here, 
but for those who are able to, to connect, uh, that's what we're using. Um, okay, so our next speaker uh, is Letha McLaren from iControl Networks. Letha. So while um, you may have heard of Nest, and you may have seen a, a, a Nest thermostats uh, of the ones that have, he mentioned have been deployed in all of those countries, I control networks you may not have heard of. So I'll spend a couple of minutes just talking about who uh, we are as a company. Um, we are a software as a service company, kind of the software application behind the scenes for a number of products in the market around the connected home applications. Um, so I'll mention a couple of those names just so you can kind of put the pieces together of who we are. We really focus on bringing together applications, data, and uh, services into a, a single unified experience for end users, attracting mass market residential homeowners. Um, our market focus really is through service providers, so companies like broadband uh, service providers or ADT uh, home security companies um, and telcos also, again, to deliver the connected home services. We're a platform approach, so we are technology agnostic. Uh, we're really just a software application that runs on a set of hardware devices inside the home offering a set of services. And we'll talk about some of the services that are driving the mass market residential consumers today. Um, these are some of the companies that we work with. So we're the, the software that powers these solutions. So you may have seen commercials on TV or you may li live in one of the, these service provider territories. But Comcast, Xfinity Homes, Time Warner Intelligent Home, uh, a number of other smaller uh, broadband service providers. Also ADT Pulse, um, we are the software that powers that solution uh, and a number of other security uh, companies. Um, also we have a new direct to consumer product, again targeting sort of the same use case for the end consumer. Um, and then we also target um, telecommunication companies. So this is a slide that was gonna build out with uh, some animation so it wasn't so overwhelming, but this beautiful graphic really describes um, where the, the mind map, if you will, of the connected home and what's driving the connected home. If you start in the center, um, many of you are probably familiar with light br uh, right brain, left brain philosophies. If you're, you know, the, with the proliferation of quizzes on Facebook, you've probably taken the quiz and you know that you're right brain or left brain centric. Um, but what we find, kind of the same school of thought, is that there's really two uh, different use cases that are really driving uh, people to purchase connected home. And so on the right-hand side, peace of mind, value proposition. So the right brain is really associated with uh, you know, people who are very good at um, expressing or reading emotions, very uh, emotional, creative driven. Um, peace of mind really is associated with that type of a, of a purchase where you're really purchasing uh, comfort and trust and uh, peace of mind. The number one use case around peace of mind is monitored security. And again, um, this is a, a solution that goes in the house that does a number of other things, but it's really anchored on people saying, oh, I need monitored security so I can protect my, my family or my home or my property. And so they're purchasing these connected home solutions, but then getting all of these other use cases also. Uh, another use case around peace of mind is interactive video. So a lot of uh, innovation coming to market around interactive video, being able to know what's going on inside your house, who's coming and going from your house while you're away. Um, and then also device monitoring. So the peace of mind of knowing that your you know, refrigerator is running property, properly or other types of devices inside your house are running properly. Kind of on the other spectrum is the quality of life. There's a certain segment of people who are purchasing connected home solutions to improve their quality of life. The number one use case for that type of a purchase is energy management. And so energy management is really driven today, you know, either from eco-conscious or, you know, eco-friendly kind of uh, um, value proposition or energy cost savings. So these are the reasons that people are, again, starting with energy management, but getting a lot of the connected home functionality also. And then the other use cases are around automation and intelligence and remote control. So how does this relate to the data that we've been talking about this morning and that uh, more speakers will talk about later? Um, really, this is a, a word heat map, so it's just one graphic that shows, um, and it's really relative, the, the, the size of the word is really representation of, of the focus that we're seeing both from the pull from the consumer, as well as the, um, the compelling use cases that are being offered uh, based on the data that we're receiving, both the public weather information as well as um, utility information around um, energy pricing and usage information. So a lot of these, these feature sets are very compelling from the end user perspective. Um, 
occupancy detection is a is a very valuable thing and and something that use that is driving a lot of the other um, value offerings. Um, you see some of these energy management solutions, uh, for instance, in Comcast's solution, Xfinity Home, they have a, an EcoSaver product, right, which, ha which uses the learning algorithms, it uses um, the public weather information all to dr and occupancy information all to drive energy efficiency for the end user. Uh, another example, ADT Pulse has done some um, public announcements around integrations with utilities through smart meter integrations, getting some of that energy and usage information and, and packaging it up for the end user so that they can save money and so that they can uh, be eco-conscious, which is purchase or per their, um, their value propositions. So these are just some examples of what we're using the energy data for today and for the mass market uh, appeal that we're, that we're going after. Thank you. Thank you, Letha, that was fantastic. Um, so the next company speaking uh, is actually a hometown favorite. Uh, this is one that the president has visited and, and talked about, and they're really uh, pioneers in taking behavioral science uh, and applying it to uh, consumers in, in real kind of simple and, and useful ways. Uh, so without further ado, Alex Kinnear from Opower. Hi, everybody. Let me get the clicker. Today, I'm going to talk about data versus the peaker plant. We all know that smart meters have brought a tremendous amount of data to the energy industry. We all know that this data has unlocked operational efficiencies inside the utility and enabled new engaging consumer experiences to be created through things like Green Button. The question is, is whether or not this data can be used to decrease peak demand. Now traditionally, peak demand has been met through a peaker plant. This is an incredibly reliable piece of equipment it stands idle for about 95 to 98 percent of its life with a crew that cycles every day to test the equipment to make sure that if a call comes it can be turned on to produce power to meet peak demand but what does data look like well this is the face of data this is an email communication one of multiple forms of communication that went out to all the residents of Baltimore last summer. If you were in Baltimore on a peak day, you got either an email, a phone call, or an SMS based on your preferences with BGE. If your phone rang, you picked it up and said, hello, this is Baltimore Gas and Electric. Tomorrow is a peak day. On historical peak days, you used 20% more energy than your neighbors. Tomorrow's a peak day. We'd really appreciate it if you could follow several of these tips to reduce your energy usage. And then we gave you some tips. After the peak day, your phone would ring again and it would say, this is Baltimore Gas and Electric. Congratulations. You reduced your energy usage 10% yesterday. We appreciate that. However, you were still 5% more than your neighbors. Here are some tips for you to follow. Traditional peaker plant versus data. Let's take a deeper look. The peaker plant is made out of concrete, steel, and aluminum. It takes years to build and get permitted. This is the face of data. It's coming from our smart meters, our phones, our computers. When we turn on the peaker plant, it costs $203 per kilowatt year. When we turn on data, it costs a lot, lot less. When we turn on that peaker plant, it emits all kinds of nasty stuff into the environment. And while it is cleaner than many coal plants, it is still emitting some nasty things into the environment. When we turn on data, it's practically emission free. How, let's turn to the Twittersphere. What do people think about their peaker plant? 
Well, unfortunately, if you go to Twitter, the only time a peaker plant is mentioned is when it's either turned off or not permitted to be built. The poor peaker. Let's turn to the Twitter sphere. Last summer, with data, an unbelievable outpouring of um, interest and passion for the program BGE ran. It's not often that the utility gets a lot of positive tweets in the Twitter sphere. But the Peaker plant is reliable. It is very reliable. However, for every unit of energy we put into it, we only get 20 to 40 percent out of it. The question is, is how will data perform? This is, you're looking um, in from the harbor at Baltimore. Okay, it's a map. Peak event is called. We blanket Baltimore with emails, SMS, and phone calls. These are the real-time communications going out across the entire population in Baltimore. And this is the real-time heat map of the energy reduction that is achieved. Red is more energy reduction to blue, which is less energy reduction. Five events called last summer. 5% reduction across the entire service territory, across all five events, all driven by data. Unfortunately, the peaker lost and data won. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. It's fantastic. Uh, so this this uh, this celebration, this Data Palooza, is a celebration of entrepreneurs and innovators uh, using energy data. That's open government data. Uh, it's green button data. And it's also crowdsourced data. And so this next one is a great example of the power of, of crowdsourcing uh, energy data. It also has a pretty neat uh, founding story. So without further ado, uh, Eric Graham from CrowdComfort. Thanks, Nick. So I'm Eric Graham, CEO of CrowdComfort. Uh, a little over a year ago, I was participating in a, um, in a clean web hackathon that uh, was, was talked about earlier. And this was Nick uh, leading an ideation session about how do we better use data to manage buildings. And we were sitting around a table, a group of us, and uh, shortly there, therein, a good friend of mine, Galen Nelson, posed this idea. What if we could use smartphone technology to unlock occupant comfort information to try to identify overheating and overcooling situations. And for me, that just sort of struck a chord. I immediately thought that this was an idea that was super simple and could work and could have a big impact. So what I did and what the, the team did was the first thing we had to do was figure out how to better geolocate where people are in buildings. And when we looked at everything that was out there, we felt that there, there was nothing as simple as a QR marker and we innovated around how we could use that to better geolocate where people are. Simple, ubiquitous, and in fact, it became incredibly useful for all kinds of reporting from occupants in buildings. The second thing we had to do was we had to create a real simple interface to allow people to report, to unlock those human sensors in buildings. And then we brought it to the market and we talked to facilities teams and real estate people and we kept hearing this common theme of a communication disconnect between them and occupants, and they were seeing our solution as a way to bridge this gap to help streamline the process and gather better data. So we added functionality. So we started with the world's first crowdsourced thermostat on the left, and then we, we had this request to gather other information in buildings, so we added the ability to attach a photograph and some text, and then aggregate that information for environmental compliance reporting purposes. And yes, this sounds very, very simple, and it is, but in fact, we may have found a way that will change the way buildings and people interact forever. So what we found the last eight months is that we get lots of users from all kinds, lots of people reporting on 
on information uh, on their comfort in particular. And this is one of our heat maps. And um, we found lots of situations where energy is being poorly used, not for comfort, um, not for better energy management. And you can see the red circle on the top right next to a very big blue circle on the bottom. We've identified lots of situations like this in buildings. And we've been able to provide little tips, piece of information that helps them better manage the energy. And when you go into it, um, this was uh, Enernox space in Boston. It's a three-story building in a larger 20-story building. And when you look at the, the aggregated report, you kind of see it's relatively evenly balanced between blue and red, hot and cold. But when you go into it and you look at the fourth floor versus the fifth versus the sixth, you'll see the blue slice gets smaller as you go up. So this, we, we identified this almost immediately when we, when we set this up at Enerock. There was a heat wave in September, and we immediately noticed that there was a thermal decline in the space. The next thing, when you look at it over a longer period of time, you see something really incredible. And when I looked at this re most recent report, you could almost visualize. So at the top, you see the elevator bank right in the middle. Above that is a reception area with a big open stairwell. And you can almost visualize the air coming down the stair, banging a left-hand turn, and cooling the entire south wall of the building. This is all data that's been collected with human sensors, with people telling us what's going on. Not a single wire or mechanical device has been installed. So this is proof positive that not only can we get this user feedback and create really great analytics, but that the human network of things, plus the internet of things, is a scientific breakthrough in comfort, energy, and most importantly, happiness for people in buildings. So what's happened since then? Um, we've got a, a pipeline of companies that we're moving very, very quickly through a process of leads, qualified um, to inbound to customers that are signing up. We've been getting, uh, you know, a, a, trying to keep up with the demand for this kind of service. So our six-member team, uh, which is soon to be about a 12-member team by the end of this year, um, is revolutionizing the way people in buildings communicate. We're leveraging this geolocated timestamp data and providing actionable information to facilities managers. And we look forward to bringing our unique solutions to the buildings that you all work and play in. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Eric. Uh, fantastic stuff. Uh, great startup, uh, growing quickly. So the next thing uh, that we wanted to highlight was public sector innovation and, and local government partners. Uh, we, we work closely, the Department of Energy works closely uh, with a number of, of cities and uh, the District of Columbia really has been a fantastic partner uh, to the Department of Energy using our, our open energy data but also our, our open software. So it's really exciting stuff uh, and some pioneering work on disclosure. Uh, so without uh, further ado, Marshall Dewar Balkan from the District of Columbia. Thank you. Good morning. Let's see how this works. So my name is Marshall. I'm going to talk about how the District of Columbia is managing building data from across the city using the standard energy efficiency data platform. So the problem fundamentally when we get people to care about energy. Oh, my animations aren't working. Oh, well. Um, so imagine what it would be like if when you went to buy a car, or you went to buy an appliance, you went to buy food, you didn't have a way of eva evaluating whether that product was going to be good for your health, good for the environment, good for your pocketbook. Of course, we do have these ways. We have labels um, that help us decide these things. So maybe that's what we need for buildings. Now, I'm not actually proposing that we stick giant labels like that on the sides of buildings. But you get the idea. The idea is that by making public information ratings on all large buildings, people are able to decide when they want to lease space, buy a building, buy a condo, decide based on its energy efficiency. The market evaluates that efficiency, driving, um, crea creating pressure for owners to compete to improve their efficiency and creating a virtuous feedback loop. The data itself creates market transformation. But how do we actually make that happen? Sounds difficult. 
So DC had passed a law that required all large buildings to annually measure their energy performance and disclose that to the government, to my office, which makes it public online. And these, these laws are now spreading around the country. There are now nine cities, two states, and one county that have benchmarking and disclosure laws. And these laws are coming to more and more cities around the country and soon you know, will be all over. And this has unlocked a treasure trove of data, more granular data on energy use than building policymakers or citizens have ever had access to before. But of course, data is only as useful as it is usable. And frankly, right now, usability is somewhat lacking. You can go now to New York City or DC's website, you can download detailed energy use on thousands of the largest buildings in the city. You can download a spreadsheet. A spreadsheet. Okay, now, so for some of the energy nerds in this room and researchers, spreadsheets are really, really cool. But frankly, no one should have to go to a government website and download a spreadsheet to get this data. There is a better way, which is what I'm here to talk about today, the SEED solution. SEED, the Standard Energy Efficiency Data Platform, is an open source online software tool being developed by the, um, funded by the U.S. Department of Energy and managed by Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, developed by Building Energy Incorporated with support from the Institute for Market Transformation. Um, it's an online tool that um, an organization can install to merge multiple data sets, manage them, track, and share information about large, massive portfolios of buildings, hundreds, thousands of buildings. The seed workflow basically is you take multiple data sources, some directly inputted, others from Energy Star Portfolio Manager or Audit or Asset Tools. You put it into your local or cloud instance of seed, which you can then access directly. This would have been much greater with, but anyway, um, you can access directly or you can look through various seed plugins, um, add-on features, or you can use the seed APIs to connect directly to your own city, city organization software tools. It also connects the building performance database, which is a anonymized decision-making um, tool using statistical analysis from U U.S. Department of Energy and third-party visualization tools, and the public can access it via all of those methods. So what does that then end up creating? Um, and what are we gonna do with it? So today I'm proud to announce that the District of Columbia, the City of Philadelphia, and the City of San Francisco are publicly committing that we will be using SEED to manage our benchmarking data and we are further committing that once the SEED APIs are available this summer, we will be using SEED to publish that data out. Um, and it'll be published out, as I said, to the BPD, which now has over one, one 750,000 building records in it, largest database of its kind anywhere in the world. But with granular energy data, we can do so much more. I want you to um, imagine the future. You can look at a building level or a heat map across the whole city. We could even have virtual augmented reality applications. You hold up your phone, you look at the building, and it tells you how much energy that building uses. That, that app doesn't exist yet, um, but maybe someone in this room will make it. This is the power of open data made possible by SEED and, and various city governments. I want to thank you very much. Um, Building Energy will be at the table this afternoon to answer more questions, and I'll be there as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Marshall. Uh, so our, we're going to shift into the grid portion of the speaking session. Um, and so our next speaker was one of the co-founders of Oracle. He then went on to found Siebel Systems and grew that to be a very successful company that he then sold back to, to Oracle, uh, a uh, pioneer in Silicon Valley, and now the uh, CEO and founder of C3 Energy Systems, Tom Siebel. Good morning. This is my fourth decade in the information technology business, and uh, in this incarnation as C3 Energy, this is a relatively large-scale private, private sector effort to apply the science of big data, cloud-scale computing, machine learning, uh, and so analytics, and social human-computer interaction models to the value chain associated with power generation and delivery. So this value chain is going through an upgrade globally where this decade, you know, order of two to three billion dollars are being spent to make all the devices in this value chain remotely machine addressable. 
the most, uh, the device that we're kind of most familiar with, oops, let me hit the right button here, would be the smart meter. And so when, when, but we're censoring these entire networks from generation through to the thermostat are being censored so we can remotely sense their state. Now, if we, if we look underlying these value chains, okay, <coughs> there, there is a, a plethora of enterprise information systems that have been installed that are, um, oh, generation management, meter data management, customer care and billing, uh, outage management, demand response, and these are all enterprise information systems, and the way the enterprise information systems will go is they don't communicate with one another. So this is a relatively large-scale effort where we've spent uh, the last five years and $150 million so far building this technology platform, okay, that allows us, ba basically I think this is without question the, the, the larger scale use case of what's going on with the open ADE XML standard that came out of the Green Button Initiative. Okay, so what we've done is we've built a technology platform where we can go into a grid operator like an Exelon, an NL, a GDF, a WES, a, uh, a, a PG&E, and take the union of the operational data and store this in a federated normalized cloud image. We load these data at the rate of six and a half billion transactions an hour. Okay, and then we run this data through, I think of it as kind of a nuclear reactor level analytics engine that does batch and stream processing, applies machine learning to look at for patterns and relationships across the data. We then manifest the insights from these analyses in a family of grid applications, what we call smart grid applications, that address the entire value chain from supply through demand, energy efficiency, what have you. Uh, we've done some work with McKinsey and Company to estimate the economic benefit. So this is about, you know, unlocking data, okay, and, and, and cloud-scale computing, big data, machine learning, to dramatically increase the reliability, the safety, the efficiency of power delivery, and dramatically reduce the environmental impact associated with those processes. And so these are where we're deploying these applications today all over the world, Exelon, PG&E, GDF, Suez, and now I'll give you some examples. There's two primary sides to this. There's the supply side, the grid side, which is by far the largest side of the market. The applications that we bring to market there, for example, uh, you know, <coughs> AMI operations manage these whole smart grid networks. Uh, revenue protection, identifies non-technical loss, theft, okay? And theft in the United States would be about 1.5% of energy produced. In Southern Italy, it's like 30%. In Brazil, it's like 50%. Uh, and you can use analytics. You can look at these data in real time and target exactly who's stealing energy and how they're doing it. Uh, system asset and risk, who looks at real time at the millions of assets in a grid infrastructure, put a real time risk index on every asset that's in the infrastructure so that you can you can basically deploy predictive maintenance, okay, and prevent failures by identifying devices that are gonna fail before they fail. Uh, demand response analytics, this is about reduce, reducing peaks, so that using analytics to reduce peaks so we don't have the peak power problem that the O-Power people mentioned. Volt VAR optimization, by balancing voltage across the system, you've reduced the amount of, this, this, this is managing capacitance in the infrastructure. By balancing voltage, you have to, you generate, you, uh, the grid operator can operate the grid with 7% less power, 7% less water that's boiled, okay? 7% less coal, natural gas, whatever it may be. So that's, that's, a, that's a big saving, 7%. Customer reliability and safety, the benefits are obvious. Okay, outage, prediction, analysis, and restoration to, to, to you know, predict weather events or, or whatever the disruption may be and bring the system back up live quickly and then grid investment planning. If we have real-time indices associated with all the assets in the grid when we're doing investments, for example, a, um, a large company in the United States would be Duke. Duke will spend order of $12 billion in grid investments in the next three years. But now they can, if they, if they understand every asset, they can use a very finely uh, pointed instrument to uh, invest those assets. Uh, grid energy intelligence, this is real-time predictive uh, uh, analytics across all the data in the grid infrastructure. Okay, then the, on the customer experience side, this would be on the demand side, these are energy efficiency programs. 
okay, for example, and this would be the left side, residential, commercial, enterprise, energy efficiency programs. Relatively a small segment of the market, I think. Okay, highly subject to, you know, it's highly dependent upon public funding. I think there's about 10% of the market opportunity, maybe five. That being said, we, we play in this market and, and we play pretty significantly. So these are about, these are the uh, recently energy, I suspect we'll establish the game that we're playing, like we played at Oracle, like we played at Siebel Systems, is to establish and maintain a market leadership position in smart grid analytics worldwide. This is about a $1.5 billion market segment. It's growing at a 24% compound annual growth rate. So it's a pretty big market in a short period of time. Uh, you know, this is, you know, we all know what these programs look like. I think in the last four months, we've won almost all of the deployment, all of the grants in the United States. It is small business enterprises. Uh, this would be particularly applicable, for example, for the GSA to perform you know, deep energy analytics you know, on any building in the G GSA infrastructure. Uh, customer segmentation and targeting, very important application. 360 degrees surrounds around communications with consumers. Uh, quick example, BGE. You know, the economic benefit of this to BGE to Exelon, you know, what we're doing at Exelon is $2.7 billion a year in recurring economic benefit. We have two million meters deployed there. We did this in six months. We integrated, you know, basically 12 systems. There's 35 billion rows of data loaded in a seven terabyte cloud image. Uh, okay, and, and uh, these are the systems that we, all the legacy systems that we, that we, that we integrated, enabled by the government open ADE XML standard. And so these are the economic benefits that they expect to accrue. It's $400 million per year that will accrue to society, to the environment, and to the customers of Exelon. So this is the game we're playing, and it's, a, uh, it's an exciting game, and it's uh, very much enabled by the work that's being driven by DOE. So thank you for those efforts. Great, thank you, Tom. Uh, so now, uh, the interesting thing about energy is that it is a uh, pretty regulated market, and a lot of that regulation is actually at the state level rather than the federal level. And so uh, we are pleased to uh, celebrate and highlight uh, uh, the kind of regulators who are thinking about energy data, uh, about customer energy data, about system data, about all the different ways that data can be harnessed and used uh, to have a safe, uh, reliable, and 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 uh, cost-effective uh, grid in their in their particular state. So I'm really, <coughs> excuse me, I'm really pleased to uh, announce Commissioner uh, Catherine Sandoval from the California Public Utility Commission. Thank you very much. Thank you for the kind invitation to be here. Um, so trying to stick to the five minutes, I uh, wanted to share with you a few things about what we're doing at the California Public Utility Commission uh, regarding data and particularly focusing on some of our uh, data access principles, resources, and also opportunities for action. Let's see, did I get this wrong, right? What am I doing? Let's see, this is link, pointer, okay. Let's see, I got the pointer. What am I doing next? There you go. All right, so I can only see that. So one of the things that uh, um, the CPUC has done is that we adopted uh, data privacy principles. So California has privacy in the California Constitution. Uh, there are about eight states that have privacy actually in our state constitution. So it is not in a penumbra as in the US Constitution, but in our constitution. So we need to be sure that whatever we do with regard to uh, data and publication of data is consistent with this privacy value. Um, so to that end, the California Public Utilities Commission adopted uh, fair information practice principles for energy usage data. So this was adopted in uh, 2012. And there are a number of principles, so I won't go over reading each one of those. And although each of the principles are equal, I wanted to highlight a couple of principles, including transparency um, and also individual participation, access and control and especially the principle that it is the individual, the customer who controls and owns the data, uh, data security, and also data minimization is an important principle to uh, collect only what you need to, um, and then uh, be careful with uh, as well how you publish that data. 
So last month, the CPUC unanimously adopted a decision that is going to uh, increase access to California investor-owned utility customer energy usage data. And uh, we did this to promote uh, research and conservation as well as education in a way that also protects privacy. So we are generating um, data that will be publicly posted and that will include a monthly sum and an average of customer electricity and natural gas use. And this will be done in a way that's consistent with our privacy policies. So we also have a number of databases that the California Public Utilities Commission and its sister agencies are using. Uh, one of our databases is the DEER database, database for energy efficiency resources. So we heard about some of the resources such as uh, lighting and different types of things that can be used to promote energy efficiency. Um, we also have renew renewable portfolio standard project data. So California is one of the states that uh, we have a 33% goal for renewable energy as our energy resource base. We already have with the investor owned utilities over 20% of the energy is renewable and we are well on our way to meeting the goal of 33% renewable energy by 2020. Governor Brown also signed the legislation that said that the 33% uh, goal is a floor and not a ceiling. So we look forward to um, being able to exceed that goal. And of course, grid optimization is gonna be part of that. So in addition to developing and, um, and taking steps to publish aggregated data on customer usage, we're also using the advanced meter infrastructure data and the green button data to facilitate grid management. And one example, is, as this previous speaker mentioned, is bolt VAR information, which is really critical to be able to integrate renewables and also manage the grid and resources. And I met with a company in uh, uh, Palo Alto a couple of weeks ago that is actually doing some very interesting stuff with regard to uh, volt VAR optimization using the AMI data and coming up with some new solutions so that you could actually have regulators either at uh, distribution nodes or even at some point incorporated into meters to help with volt VAR optimization to ensure uh, that we can run the grid optimally and to also be able to better integrate renewable resources. We also work with our sister agencies, such as the California Energy Commission, to produce an energy policy report, the IPA report, which is data-driven. And on building standards, I saw someone walk in with a bag on standards, so very important. And the California Independent System Operator um, also puts out a lot of information on grid reliability, demand, and market data. So again, also an important source of data. So one issue that I wanted to also talk to you about, um, I gave the title of what we don't know does hurt us. And that this is an example of something where we don't have data. Um, so this issue really came to my attention as I've been working on a proceeding looking at rural telecommunications access in California. And I was also honored to speak at the FCC on the rural telco uh, workshop a couple of, of weeks ago. And one of the things that we've begun to realize and really um, think about how we can take action on is that there are many Californians, thousands of them, actually part of the problem is we don't know how many, who don't have access to the electric grid because they've lived beyond the reach of the electric grid and many of them are in tribal areas but some of them are not in other rural areas. And they also lack sur access to telephone service uh, and broadband internet service and in fact there's an interrelationship between the two as anybody who spent time inside a central office for a telephone system knows you can't have a telephone system without access to reliable power and electricity as well as to the public switch no telephone network. And the same for cell phones and cell phone towers. Cell phone towers are uh, connected to electricity. And what's happening is that many off-grid users are using diesel generators. In some cases, they might have solar, um, but also depending on where you are, like in the Yurok tribe, which is near Eureka, there's not enough solar gain. Um, we can try to promote solar and storage, but also the use of diesel is being done at a high financial cost to the users, a high environmental cost, um, and also health cost. And so I'm proposing to have us collect data and to especially work with the tribes to collect data on off-grid diesel generation and analyze the mechanisms to increase grid access, renewable energy storage access, and including to use California's carbon market to look at how we can increase access. So you see here an example of this at the Yurok Reservation. This is California's largest tribe. They're in far northern California. It's over 5,000 members of the Yurok tribe. 
And on the left is a picture of a school. It's a K through eight school that is run by these two diesel generators. You can see the school bus in the back left. And I met teachers who talk about the constant hum of these generators all day long because there is no electricity in this area. So the CPUC funded a project along with the Rural Utility Service to bring access and electricity to many parts of the Yurok Reservation. And so we have now for uh, several parts, but there are some people who are still not connected. And when I visited there a couple of weeks ago, we were walking around in one area talking about electricity and uh, what we're gonna do. And this one lady said, hey, you forgot us down here. We don't have electricity. And she's still running on diesel generators. So we have the opportunity to visit with this family, the, the uh, Thayers, um, and you see his kids um, hanging onto his legs down there. As he's making a phone call, he got telephone service. This whole area got telephone service last month. And they don't have cell phone service. They face the wrong side of the mountain to get satellite service. And so now that he has telephone service, he's already in a month called 911 to report a brush fire and really stop the wildfire and his blind father is using the phone to call a service called Tell Me. You can't have the phone access without electrical access. So pg and is completing the electrical access was critical to enabling the phone access. So two last issues I wanna quickly mention because I know my time is running short, is also the role of data in water management. And so uh, water um, is the largest user of energy in the state of California, and conversely, energy is the largest user of water nationally. So in California, at the Public Utilities Commission, we have a proceeding that will consider the nexus between water and energy. We're calculating the embedded energy in water and also considering actions to address uh, California's historic drought. And so using technology communications and data, you can do things like leak detection and, for example, identify when a user's water never goes to zero and that they probably have a leak and enable action, as well as to use remote sensors. So the Internet of Things will also include the Internet of Props. And again, one of the primary barriers to that is the lack of access to electricity as well as communications. So we're also um, using data through the California Lifeline program, and we've expanded our state Lifeline program to mobile, and also encourage the electric utilities to, and the gas utilities to work with Lifeline providers to encourage participation in low-income energy efficiency programs. I should also mention that for people who are totally off-grid, like those people running on diesel, because they're not um, utility customers, they're ineligible for energy efficiency programs or other subsidies. So there's different things that we need to address with them. And also we've been very pleased to work on several apps for energy hackathons with the Department of Energy and uh, Matt Thiel and Nick Sinai. So, and I was very pleased to be able to be a, a judge for the DOE apps for energy uh, hackathon, some terrific apps. So the last thing I'd like to mention is also how we can use data to not only identify communities with high environmental burdens. And so this is a map that was put together by Cal EPA and it's our EnviroScreen map. And it identifies pollution burdens, including air quality, pesticide use, and a variety of other factors, and sensitive populations. And then it could also be overlaid with other things, such as areas that lack ac robust access to internet, which is something that we've been mapping in California, high wildfire danger, high diesel generation use, lack of access to electricity, tribal areas, et cetera. So by using data, we can help to identify pri policy priorities and opportunities for action. So thank you very much. Really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Commissioner Sandoval. That was fantastic. There's so much great stuff going on in California. I'm a little biased. I'm a uh, native of California. So um, our next speaker is from a company that is uh, helping uncover a uh, dirty little secret about energy. And so energy efficiency, the, the industry actually isn't that efficient. It's very manual. And so there's a, a, a whole cluster of, of companies, including this one in Boston, that are attacking this, this problem. And how do you take a very manual uh, process and, and with big data, building analytics, science in the cloud, uh, really transform the, uh, this in, in fantastic ways. Uh, so I'm pleased to introduce uh, Swap Shaw from First Fuel. Good morning. Hopefully everyone's still awake. Um, it's great to be here again. 
at the second data palooza. And uh, my name is Swap Shah. I'm one of the co-founders and the CEO for First Fuel. Uh, we're an energy data analytics company based in Boston, uh, about three and a half years old. Um, and we've grown quite substantially, about 75 people across the country. We focus primarily on driving very large scale energy efficiency in the commercial building sector. So it's a non-residential building sector. In the last uh, data palooza, um, we talked about We talked about um, how we approach this problem of scale. Um, you know, no longer, if we have 5.2 million commercial buildings in the United States that need to be analyzed, understood, and made efficient, we can't enter every one of them with a highly qualified engineer, and months later get a 50-page report that typically sits on a shelf collecting dust never to be acted upon. So we had to change the game in how we approach the whole market. And we use data to do that. So by combining high-frequency meter data with third-party open government data sources, such as weather data, GIS data, federal, local, and uh, state databases, as well as private databases, we could take all of that open available data and run some sophisticated analytics on that to create a very deep energy performance profile of the building's energy consumption. And the output of all of this is a very accurate and appointed set of recommendations on how energy performance can be improved in every specific building out there. So that, in the last 20 months, since the last time we presented this, I'd like to share with you this morning what we've actually accomplished in a very short amount of time that would have been very difficult to accomplish in the traditional approaches. Just in the last 20 months, we've analyzed and audited more than a billion square feet of commercial real estate space out there. We've also identified 2.6 billion kilowatt hours of energy savings, which is the equivalent of taking almost a quarter of a million, of ho million homes offline, off the grid, for almost a year. To compare this, if we had to accomplish the same thing using the traditional approaches, it would have taken 100 auditors almost 10 years at a cost of $100 million to come to the same point. We accomplished it in a lot shorter time and at a fraction of the cost. And along the way, we actually learned some very interesting things about how buildings behave and how they consume energy. For example, these are two buildings in the Chicago area. They're essentially identical in many respects. They're about the same size, have similar systems, built around the same time, and they also have a similar energy footprint when it comes to a per square foot basis. If we were to look at these buildings in the traditional simulation-based approach, we would dictate that the buildings have very similar energy savings profile, and the recommendations would be quite similar in terms of how to improve the energy, and energy performance of these buildings. However, when you analyze a year's worth of consumption data, you get a very different story, right? Where the energy is going and what recommendations one would come up for each building are quite different. Now, why is that? Well, the reason for that is because who uses the building and how the building is operated has a significant influence on the building's energy's consumption and its, usage pro and its consumption profile. And understanding that profile leads you to very different conclusions on what needs to get done in each building to improve its energy performance. So the moral of the story here is no two buildings are alike, even if they physically seem to look the same. Another really interesting insight, which has huge ramifications on how uh, uh, the, the commissioner talked about how money gets spent to achieve energy efficiency programs it has to do with where the energy efficiency opportunities actually lie in buildings. So the conventional wisdom and a large percentage of the investment in energy efficiency today goes into retrofits and in upgrading the lights and upgrading the HVAC equipment in, 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 in fixing the exterior of the building. However, by looking at thousands of buildings across the country, what we've identified is that a significant portion, almost half the energy savings potential in buildings, are related to the operations of the buildings. So low cost, no cost actions such as turning the lights off, turning off HVAC equipment on weekends, sequence CD equipment. One of the largest waste happening in buildings today is the simultaneous running of heating and cooling in the building. And that's similar to you, know, you driving down the highway with your, gas with your foot down on the gas pedal and using your brake to control the speed. So 
this has huge ramifications on how money gets spent. So last year, utilities in North America spent north of $10 billion on energy efficiency programs. But guess what? Only a small fraction of that money was actually spent on helping improve the operations of the building. The majority of that money went to imp or upgrading the, the, the physical aspects of the building. So this data, through the lens of the data, when you look at the buildings, the suggestion here is that a large percentage of that investment should go into low cost, no cost improvements because they're the low hanging fruit of building energy conservation. And we're applying this right here in Washington DC. In this very building that we're sitting in, which we analyzed last year for the GSA, we uncovered opportunities to save, uh, and, and to save almost a half a million dollars a year, which is already being, uh, being saved by the GSA. And so far, working with the GSA, we've um, analyzed 101 of their uh, largest buildings, representing about 54 million square feet, and they've started saving $5 million a year just within the course of, a, uh, course of the last 12 months through the work that we're doing with them. This morning, we just announced one of the largest uh, deployments and the first deployments of the Green Button Initiative, working with the GSA. So we're really proud of what open energy data has allowed us to energize and drive large-scale energy efficiency in the commercial building sector. And we look forward to helping achieve the President's agenda in reducing commercial building energy over the next few years. Thanks for your time. Great, thank you, Swap. Uh, fantastic presentation. Um, and so you've been hearing from a number of uh, largely private sector entrepreneurs and technology companies, uh, but we thought it was important to also recognize innovation uh, inside the utility. And so National Grid has been a big supporter of the Energy Data Initiative and the Climate Data Initiative and, and a number of uh, administration efforts. And so we're really excited to present uh, Sherry Warren from National Grid. Good morning probably wondering why there's a utility executive standing up here on stage talking to you about innovation. And I'm guessing that probably a number of you just thought about technology as I said that word, innovation. And, and I would submit to you that it's actually a whole lot more about human behavior. And if we think about human behavior, and we heard Seth this morning, what really drives people? They want to be normal. In fact, if I find out my neighbor's using less energy, odds are I'm going to use a lot less too. I know Powers Research showed that, so it was good to have Seth up here this morning. So if you think about that human element, that human behavior, how do we start to drive a new energy normal? Well, National Grid thinks you've got to get started with three key things. First thing, you've got to put the customer in the driver's seat, and you've got to truly listen to them. Secondly, we've got to shift our regulatory models, and as you heard, there's 50 different ones plus the feds. Everybody's got a slightly different view. We need to get focused on the customer. And thirdly, we need a much more resilient and technologically capable grid in order to start that journey towards that new normal for energy. You guys remember cell phones about 15 years ago? And I know some of you are pretty young, so maybe you don't remember the bag phone there on the right. But that bag phone was quite large, pretty expensive. Emergency personnel used it. And it was great at the time. And I bet at that moment in time, no one could have envisioned a time where text messages, you could buy that plan, they'd throw the voice in for free, right? How far have we come in that new normal that got created via cell phones? So if anybody have a teenager or interact with a teenager, what do you see? Right, all they do is look at their screens. And when they're looking at their screens, what are they actually doing? Well, they're searching for data. They're searching for information. They're finding their friends and they're asking whatever question pops into their head. Do zebras have brown stripes? Yep, when they're born. What's their new energy normal? And we're pretty convinced it's gonna be data driven and we're gonna need a lot more real time pricing and ability to charge their apps and their devices wherever they are, whenever they wanna be there. So we're standing at the beginning of a journey and we believe that that journey needs to be taken with customers, regulators, legislators, vendors, and with people of all different descriptions, and that if we can co-create a future for energy, that that's the journey that we need to be on. You guys might recognize some of these folks. We've got Tesla, Edison, and Westinghouse up there. 
they developed the power system back in the late 1800s, and of course the scary part is they'd recognize every single component that I still haven't played today. In fact, I've got a line Thomas Edison built still in service in upstate New York, and there's pipe that was laid at the time Abraham Lincoln was president. Hopefully you agree with me, it's time to transform this grid to become an innovation playground. It's gotta start to change and re-enable all of our lives, the way we live on our terms. And part of that's gotta be multi-way power flow. It's gotta have a lot more open source data and actionable information. That regulatory model has got to shift from the monopolistic regula regulatory view to a really customer-based innovation focus, and we've gotta get that grid ready to go. So I get excited about tech, right? And doing a lot of innovative work, we'll tell you about that in a minute. But at the end of the day, that whole technology suite has gotta be about giving customers actionable information whether it's what they connect to our grid, how they use our energy, and what decisions they may make over time, or that their appliances may make, as you heard this morning. That's why Green Button's so important. And so we signed up for the Green Button Initiative, even though we don't have a lot of AMI meters yet, and trying to make it work with the information that we have. And when do you need information most? Well, you need that information in times of crisis. Something like Superstorm Sandy, you need real-time actionable information in your hands. And that's why National Grid's developed a number of innovative projects, and if you wanna see them, come see the booth later on. The first one is with MIT, we developed a predictive model that can actually tell us where the damage is gonna be on our system ahead of the storm. Today, we fed it six storms, and it's 85% accurate. Secondly, we developed a damage assessment tool off the back of the Esri platform, and we're able to send folks in the field, get data, come back through the cloud, and make a very different um, prediction about where we need to send crews, and then finally, situational analysis tool. So we went from a situation where we gave customers that was data that was eight hours old to 15 minute real time. Now they can take action in their lives and make the decisions they've gotta make in times of crisis. And that's why I'm really proud to announce today that along with a number of other utilities, we're working very hard to make an open source approach for power outage data. So when the next Superstorm Sandy comes, hopefully a lot of the utilities will be putting that info out into the public domain so people can take action. And of course we need to modernize that grid. So I mentioned one-way power flow. Today, you wanna to put distributed generation, solar, wind on our grid. I'm able to pervasively provide that opportunity for everyone because the power flow is one way. We've gotta get ourselves into a very different situation. So, if you agree with me that we're moving towards a new energy normal and that if customers in the driver's seat we start to change that regulatory model and we make the grid a little more resilient, then I hope all of you, with all of the data that we have out there, will work together to find that new energy normal, and I'll have some nifty picture 10 years from now that shows the transformation in the grid. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Sherry. It's a really exciting announcement of a number of utilities uh, collaborating together to do open data, taking power outage data, and um, I think it's, the potential is really fantastic. Uh, a lot of folks go to utility websites in times of crisis, but uh, you can also imagine uh, that data making its way to Google crisis maps and other platforms. And really, that's, that's the whole idea behind open data is, is how do you kind of power uh, that kind of innovation. So it's really exciting stuff, and, and thank you, Sherry. We're gonna take, <coughs> excuse me, we're gonna take a quick break. Uh, 20 minutes. Uh, we're going to start promptly back at 11.15. The restrooms are back that way. And um, uh, there is a food court if you're dying for a quick coffee, but we're starting in 20 minutes. So stretch your legs. Uh, well, I am super fired up for the second half of the Energy Data Palooza. Reminder, uh, hashtag is uh, energy data, um, and please uh, keep tweeting it. Um, and so uh, before we get started with our next set of lightning speakers, um, I did want to say a thank you. Uh, thank you to uh, uh, all the, the folks uh, across the White House and, and uh, General Services Administration, and especially the, the Department of Energy. The Department of Energy has been a huge partner in putting this uh, effort on. And so if everyone could uh, uh, join me in with a round of applause for all the staff. The 
these are really uh, uh, fun events, but they but they a lot of work behind the scenes. And so now we're gonna uh, go to renewable energy lightning speakers. Uh, the first one is uh, Jason Riley from Genability, and this is a energy data company helping the uh, solar world deploy solar uh, better, faster, cheaper. So, Jason. Good morning. I hope everybody enjoyed the break. Uh, so, as Nick mentioned, Genability is an energy data company. Uh, we help solar companies, we help electric vehicle companies, we help um, um, connected home companies and a whole slew of new energy companies understand exactly what you're spending and what you may be saving when moving to a new, cleaner, more renewable, smarter energy future. Uh, but when I go home, I'm not in charge of the energy, it's my kids. They're the energy managers. Here's Lily, my daughter, she's head of facilities, as you can tell. Here's Elliot, he's uh, on transportation. Um, until very recently, Elliot uh, drove us around in a Toyota Sienna, but he became increasingly frustrated with the rising gasoline costs, uh, as well as, actually that should be $3,000, so it's rising even faster, as well as um, the fact that his cabin uh, footprint was not where he wanted it to be. So him and his sister blew their college fund on buying this brand new Tesla. <laughs> as you can imagine, Dad was not particularly happy with this. Uh, Elliot, on the other hand, is absolutely over the moon, as you can tell. Um, it's, not just, uh, it's not just that he blew his college fund, but he's actually saving the planet in, in doing so. Um, and he's actually saving himself $1,100 on fuel savings by switching from gasoline to electricity. Genability calculated that number. Um, so why are the kids so frustrated and why are they so uh, concerned looking? Well. Like you and I in this audience, uh, they are avid readers of green tech media and they absolutely understand some of the challenges that are facing us as we move to this new, cleaner, smarter energy economy. They're particularly concerned with the duck. Um, and they're worried that when they drive home from soccer practice and with all their buddies and they pl everybody plugs in their electric car in the neighborhood, that they're gonna stress the grid, maybe cause some instability and ultimately uh, cause rates to increase. They don't like uh, rates increasing. They have to afford college after all. Uh, so what we really need is a world in which utilities are providing smart price signals for smart EV charging that ties nicely into uh, on-car and on-phone uh, applications, rather like this one that BMW is rolling out to its i3 drivers, which again is powered by Genability. Uh, so here's Elliot, he's pretty happy. He's actually switched over to PG&E's EVA rate plan which uh, significantly uh, incentivizes him to charge his new Tesla at night time when the load to the grid is lower. Uh, and in doing so, he's actually managed to ratchet up to about $4,000 in savings. So he's pretty happy. Uh, they're cruising around the neighborhood in their brand new electric car looking good. They've completely reduced their carbon footprint from uh, driving. Um, and uh, Lily, the facility manager, has decided it's time to look at the building too. So she called up a local installer and using some tools from Genability, the installer was able to correctly size their system right, right around 77% of their load uh, to optimize their additional savings. It's $41 for them, which isn't a, you know, a lot of money, but every little helps when you're trying to get back to college. Um, and what uh, kindergartners all around the country are finding is that uh, energy uh, from the solar panels is becoming more and more competitive with the grid every day. Uh, but what's incredibly exciting for a company like Genability is that we can do much more than we are doing right now. If you look at this great uh, uh, data from NREL, uh, another open data company, uh, open data institution, you can see that 64% of uh, the current cost of a solar system is actually tied up in what are called so-called soft costs, which are a data-rich opportunity. Uh, and there's lots of companies that are part of the Sunshot Challenge that are trying to tackle some of these, Genability being one of them. Uh, and with that in mind, I'm pleased to announce that today uh, we're starting what we're calling the Open Solar Savings Initiative. Um, as you would imagine from something called Open Solar Savings, it's about publishing open solar savings data. Uh, available via API to anybody who wants to use it. We'll also be building a web tool on top to kind of showcase the data that's available. And we're really interested in seeing energy educators, uh, solar marketers, energy installers, et cetera, using this data to further reduce those soft costs down to a, a level, as level as low as we possibly can. So here's my kids chilling. They're on top of their new Tesla. They've lowered their energy footprint. 
they've uh, managed to start saving some money, they may actually make it to college. Um, I think it shows the power that open data and energy data can, um, can do to transfer us to this new, cleaner, more smart, renewable energy future. And as anybody who knows who's got kids, when kids are happy, dad's happy. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. That was fantastic. Um, our next speaker uh, is in the theme of small and distributed is beautiful, uh, a, a trend in a lot of energy. And typically, we think about uh, distributed solar. But this next speaker uh, speaking about distributed uh, hydropower. Uh, so uh, Michael Carr from the New England Hydropower Company. Thank you. Well, good morning. Uh, New England Hydropower is a designer, developer, implementer, owner, and operator of small-scale hydropower power, uh, facilities in New England. And I'm going to talk this morning about how we use open white hot source data to uh, affect an ancient technology. Most people's view of hydropower is massive. Here, 200, 2,000 megawatts, 4 billion kilowatt hours of power, hydraulic head of 590 feet. Uh, our view is a little more modest. This is a 50 kilowatt screw operating in a neighborhood. This is local. Most turbines look like this, 700 kilowatt turbine. Uh, we do the economy version. This is a 20 kilowatt turbine, 25 feet long, five feet in diameter, less capital, and easier to implement. Their machine sheds require massive, massive investment. This actually is the Three Gorges Dam, 32 turbines, each 700 megawatts in size. Ah, ours is just a little smaller and requires a little less investment. Most particularly, it's local, it's distributed, and it operates at a very low levelized cost of energy. Now, our hero in all of this is, is a Greek, uh, born in Sicily, working in Egypt 2,000 years ago. Uh, and he invented something that has yet to pass its sell-by date. Uh, the Archimedes screw, originally used for raising up water, in this case, uh, wind-driven, somewhere in Holland. What New England hydropower does is it turns that screw on its end, sticks a gearbox on the top, a generator, some controls, and then creates three-phase power. Those tanks are big, slow-moving tanks of water, going around about 30 to 40 revolutions a minute, obviously geared up to get to distribution power. But the benefit is that fish can pass safely through them. They're going down in big tanks of water. And there's a very low uh, environmental impact. Well, that's all interesting, but how on earth do you go and find a place to put this uh, technology? We are the first implementers of this technology in North America. Uh, it is almost a de facto standard now in the UK, uh, and in France, and in uh, uh, Austria. Um, well, we need to find you know, the data to allow us to repurpose this old technology. Well, the good news is there is a ton of data out there. It abounds. Um, and, you know, back in, I think it was 2000, well, the uh, Army Corps of Engineers maps would say there were over 80,000 dams across the United States. Uh, their heads are 800, that's the height of the dam, down to uh, five or six feet. We're interested in sites where they are under 30 feet for this technology, very specific. And then in April this year, um, Oak Ridge came out with a study that said, if you looked at the resources available across three million rivers and streams, there is enough potential energy there to develop the same equivalent capacity of hydropower as exists in the US today. And that sort of goes and complements a study that DOE, EERE, produced in April of 2012, which said there were four um, uh, 54,000 non-par dams. So then you take it down to the local level. The state um, uh, dam statistics uh, provide another layer. 
10,000 dams in New England. And then you take it down one step lower. lower. There are hundreds in every state. This is the legacy of the water part era, the era which built our industrial revolution. So we're just doing what they did so well 100 years ago. And the, 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 I think the other key point is here that this is in your backyard, and it's all supported also by 100 years of water records. So the USGS uh, stream stats give you 100 years of records. The last 30 years would indicate um, that the stream flows have increased. NOAA data would indicate that it's going to continue to increase. So what do we do with all of this? That data informs our field work. For the last two summers, we've had a bright, very bright bunch of engineers paid, uh, trained interns, who've used our software, our data, and analyzed the market down to the 12 characteristics that we see essential for our technology. They then went out and spent field work time looking at over 800 sites across New England and New York State. With that, we then get our, uh, we get our information that we can then create uh, to engage with FERC, with US Fish and Wildlife, with the local communities. We develop repeatable processes. And at the end of the day, it's allowed us to raise cap. That data has allowed us to identify a market, to raise capital. We always need more capital. This is a capital business, but it's a long-term annuity business. So starting with 80,000, we get down to 500 sites in New England alone where we think uh, this technology is applicable. And you say, well, does it really count? Well, 40,000 homes could be powered by this. That's one half of 1% of the home usage energy um, in uh, the New England states. For us, it's enough to build a business. And for the uh, society in general, we're using this data to then repower an old technology and ultimately contribute towards the renewable energy mix and climate change, and, and help reverse the effects of climate change. So with that, thank you. Great, Great. thank you, Michael. Uh, next, uh, our final lightning round uh, presentation from an entrepreneur. Uh, this is a company that is helping attack the soft costs of solar with data. Really exciting stuff. Uh, Aaron Waro from Solar Census. Good morning. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, my name is Aaron Worrell. I am the founder and CEO of Solar Census. We have developed the first commercial grade software to enable automated rooftop surveys for solar PV over the web. Uh, 15 years ago, I set out, like many of you here today, to confront global warming and big oil. Along the way, I began selling residential solar, and I was amazed when people all over California wanted to make the switch. As I learned the trade, I discovered that for each individual rooftop, I had to perform something called a site survey, which requires a lot of precise measurements due to shade from trees and geometry of rooftops. In true story, one day I'm in San Francisco. I load up my ladder. I drive out to the customer's house. I'm standing on his roof. I've got a tape measure in one hand and a shade tool in the other. And I'm kind of contorting myself to get all the correct measurements. And I fall off the roof. And I hit every branch and bush on the way down. Uh, I lost the sale. And I lost my job <laughs> that day. Uh, and the very next day, I set out to eliminate the process entirely. And at Solar Census, uh, with generous support from the DOE Sunshot program, we've done it. So why does this technology matter? The answer is location, location, location. Solar Census locates energy. Just as technology is used to locate oil and natural gas before drilling, coal before mining, this technology finds precisely where solar power can be produced. Accuracy is everything. And the National Renewable Energy Laboratory concluded that our software was scientifically equivalent to a physical site survey. So how do we do this? Perhaps the best way to think about this is that we map the world in 4D. Our patented algorithms insert time as a function 
and do a pre-constructed three-dimensional model. The information about the sun's daily path, weather patterns, climate records, are all open data resources from NREL, NOAA, and others that are essential to our product's accuracy. We integrate all of this open data into our software so that we can view the world as the sun sees it. It can take over a week to provide a quote that involves a physical site survey. But with our technology in the cloud, it takes less than one second. And that radical increase in efficiency is reflected in serious dollars. NREL estimates that a tool like ours will reduce soft costs by 17 cents per watt at scale, which is 30% of all customer acquisition costs in the solar industry, totaling over $1,000 off the cost of a, of a residential system and saving over $130 million in the U.S. this year alone. You stretch that over 15 years, given the astounding industry growth projections, and we're talking about eliminating a 50 billion dollar pain point with this tech. Those savings go straight into the pockets of homeowners who go solar and the installers across the country that get the job done. In the hands of solar companies and search engines, our technology can drastically reduce costs and accelerate adoption. But what truly drives us is that we believe this technology platform will catalyze a revolution in solar software development. Companies and governments can build all of the necessary tools on top of this platform to finally bring together what I would argue to be the two most important innovations of our time, solar power and the internet. In the 90s, Michael Dell developed a model to deliver customized personal computers directly to the homeowner over the web and made it cost effective. The way to accomplish this mass customization was what Dell called virtual integration. In this model, a core technology platform coordinates across company boundaries and the consumer seamlessly benefits from the specializations and expertise of each component in the supply chain. With a global map of solar potential measured down to the square foot, virtual integration becomes possible for the solar industry. A customized system is designed for the consumer by the time Google or Bing sends back a results page. The ROI for every PV system is certified geometrically. The site survey is already done, so multiple installers can bid for the job instantly. Major technical barriers are removed, so contractors and electricians can enter the solar industry faster and with higher margins, creating more green jobs and broadening the workforce. Banks are likewise able to guarantee generation potential with additional software with additional financial software, can securely commit financing directly to the homeowner. Bringing a solar, buying a solar system should be as easy as buying a PC, we think. So to sum up, once solar energy is located remotely and the preferences of the homeowner are captured, the rest of the engineering can be completed. The installation labor and the financing are available. Everything is customized for the homeowner from the initial search to the close mass customization, virtual integration. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Aaron. That was fantastic. OK, so now we're turning to the uh, final piece of the uh, morning speaking session, uh, after which we're going to have a uh, technology showcase, much more informal science fair style with uh, live demos of apps and just a chance to continue the interstitial conversation, which is so valuable and interesting on a number of different fronts here. Uh, so uh, the, the next speaker uh, I'm pleased to introduce uh, started his career at the White House in the Office of Management and Budget. He then moved to uh, a local government. It was the uh, District of Columbia. He was then at the Department of Treasury. He was actually the Senior Sustainability Officer, among uh, other roles, uh, at the Department of Treasury. And now he is the administrator of the General Services Administration. Uh, and he really has been a uh, public innovator uh, on both the digital side uh, as well as the building side. He's uh, America's, or at least the, the federal government landlord. Uh, and he's really doing just tremendous and innovative work on all of these fronts. So I am, I am humbled and, and pleased to introduce Dan Tanglerini. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. It's really great to be here. Uh, I want to start by thanking um, the Department of Energy and the Office of Science and Technology Policy. I want to thank all of you for being here and contributing to uh, what we're trying to do here today. Um, when I heard this morning, when I was reminded this morning that I was get a, going to get to come over here, I was really, I was really psyched, to be perfectly honest, because I, I was going to work on three of my favorite things. We're, we're going to deal with three of my favorite things. First, energy. Second, data. And third, palooza-ing. Um, so, woo, exactly. Um, so I hope you've had a great palooza so far. Um, uh, some of these presentations have been fantastic, and I realize I'm standing between you and a couple of main events. So I'm going to try to uh, be fast, be punchy, and try to sell you on the idea that the General Services Administration is more than just the people who brought you this auditorium. In fact, uh, the General Services Administration, part of the administration, recognizes the value and the importance of uh, really approaching energy sustainability and energy efficiency. Um, now, it helps that there's an executive order, 13514, which is about federal leadership on environmental energy and economic performance, which set aggressive targets for all the agencies. Um, but we knew that given the size of our building portfolio, that we were going to need to play a particularly significant role in um, the way uh, these, uh, the requirements under uh, that EEO were met. Um, we made it one of our key priorities uh, as well as we looked at how we could better deliver services to the American taxpayer. And with uh, 375 million square feet of office space, we're one of the largest commercial real estate management uh, operations in the world, and $60 billion, more than $60 billion of contracting going through the General Services Administration, including the management administration of over 200,000 automobiles as part of the federal fleet, we recognize that we stand in a very important and significant place within the federal government for the ability to make a substantial impact on energy sustainability and energy efficiency. Now, uh, the other thing that's really driving uh, our issue of interest and concern across uh, the federal government is the fact that we need to make our financial position more sustainable. And the simple fact is by going green, we save green, we bring those two lines in closer, um, in closer uh, proximity to each other. Hopefully getting the green one to intersect the red one at some point very soon. We also have to recognize though that the world in which we're operating in has changed dramatically. In the last six years, there's been a real transformation in the way people relate to information and frankly relate to each other. This is the tip of the technological iceberg that we all carry around in our pockets now, the, the smartphone. And what it has done for us and the way we relate, the way we go to market, the way we share information, and frankly, the access to information that we have, each one of us, um, is uh, changed dramatically. Which means that we've had to think about ways that we free that data, we, we democratize that data. And one of the things we've been a leading proponent in within GSA is moving more of our data to the cloud and making it more accessible in real time to everyone. We've also been a leader within the government of making data, federal data, available to smart people, to everyone uh, within the, the U.S. through data.gov. We've had over five, uh, nearly five million unique visits to data.gov. We have 105,000 data sets representing 227 federal organizations. And GSA has also recognized the power of the Internet of Things and cloud to go and capture data continuously from building systems within uh, within our uh, operating environment. We started something called GSA Link, a cloud-based uh, system that allows us to engage in continuing commissioning of our buildings. Uh, that allowed us to find this right here in this building, a rogue fan. A rogue fan, you can imagine this giant rogue fan just running in the, in the parking garage, chewing up $800,000 of energy that didn't need to be spent. So we recognize that with uh, an asset inventory spread all across the country, that there is an opportunity for us to use smart systems like the green button to uh, have access to information gained from uh, utilities that allow us uh, to have a better understanding of how things should be running, what things are running, and what things need to be turned off. 
And that allows us then to better understand not only the, uh, the, the easy to find or easy to um, identify issues like a rogue fan in a big building in the middle of downtown Washington, D.C., but even um, how things are operating, how we're spending money, how we're um, uh, maintaining an asset such as the uh, Port of Calais, the land port of entry up in Calais, Maine, about as far away from anything as you can get in the lower 48. So um, GSA is uh, committed to working with our partners at, um, at the Department of Energy. We're committed to being a great steward of the assets that we uh, get to maintain and operate for our federal uh, agency partners. And we're really committed to getting the benefit of the conversation and the palusing that's happening here today. Someone who I think uh, understands uh, Palooza's on uh, several levels, um, at meta levels, uh, with uh, you know his uh, incredible brain power, his incredible skill, his incredible commitment, frankly, to these kinds of issues, to sharing data, to getting the most out of data, is someone I uh, am truly honored to be able to serve with, and that's John Holdren, the President's Science Advisor, and the person who's up next, John. Thank you very much, Dan, uh, including f not just for that introduction, but for your incredible leadership in advancing uh, innovation uh, across the United States government, really uh, inspiring, uh, inspiring performance on your part. And thanks to all of you for being here. Um, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, which I direct, did not bring you this building, but it did bring you Todd Park and his team, and with him, the very notion of palooza -ing in government. So we'll, we'll happily take credit uh, for that. And I do uh, understand that today's event uh, has really been extraordinary uh, so far with passion, commitment, energy, creativity uh, literally oozing from the walls of this uh, auditorium. Uh, so it is a particular pleasure to be here and to thank you on behalf of President Obama and all of my colleagues across government. Uh, for the extraordinary private and public sector innovation uh, and the innovators who are here today who've been doing it uh, to share their enthusiasm and to demonstrate uh, their ideas. Uh, as I think you all know, President Obama's all of the above energy strategy recognizes that we need to fully tap American assets, innovation, and technology in order to safely and responsibly develop our domestic energy sources in order to ensure that we maximize the efficiency with which energy is used to deliver the goods and services that we want and require, and to ensure that the role of the resulting technologies and capabilities in the world energy economy continues to increase. Uh, those goals require, among other things, harnessing every ounce of America's creativity and ingenuity in order to provide consumers with choices that will enable them to reduce costs, to save energy, and at the same time to protect the environment. Uh, as we've seen, as you've seen already on the stage today, and as we'll see at the Innovation Showcase shortly, entrepreneurs and innovators have been rising to that challenge. You have been rising to that challenge by unlocking the promise of open government data as fuel for innovation that benefits society. You've been using open government data and open source software to build new apps, services, and even entire new companies that cut energy waste in buildings, strengthen the grid, deploy renewables faster, and achieve a variety of other important goals in the domain of uh, energy and sustainable energy. We're really, you and we, I think, are together unleashing a torrent of innovation in service of a sustainable energy future. And perhaps the most intractable problem in the way of achieving that sustainable energy future is the challenge around the intersection of energy and climate change. Uh, most of you know that earlier this month, the Obama administration released the third national climate assessment. It's an 800 plus page scientific assessment, which lays out at an unprecedented level of breadth, clarity, and geographically and economically granular detail how climate change is affecting every part of our country, all major geographic regions and key sections of our national economy and our society. And the bottom line 
All the way across this very detailed but still accessible report is that climate change can no longer be characterized as a distant threat. It is affecting the American people now, as well as other people around the world, in important ways. Summers are longer and hotter with longer periods of extended heat. Wildfires are starting earlier in the spring and continuing later into the fall. Rain is coming over nearly the entire United States in heavier downpours. People are experiencing changes in the length and severity of their seasonal allergies, me among them. If I sneeze during this presentation, you'll know why. And climate disruptions to agriculture and water resources have all been increasing. But I think particularly germane to this audience, the assessment also looked at the effect of climate change on key sectors of the economy, including the energy sector. The National Climate Assessment found that extreme weather events are affecting energy production and delivery facilities, causing supply disruptions of varying lengths and magnitude, and affecting other infrastructure components that depend on energy supply. It found that higher summer temperatures are going to increase electricity use and particularly cause higher summer peak loads. And of course, as you already know, the summer peak load is the one that dominates the annual peak loads for the electricity system. And it found that depending on the character of changes in the energy mix going forward, climate change will introduce both new risks and new opportunities. And I need to tell you again that President Obama recognizes the urgency of addressing those risks and seizing the opportunities. That's why in the Climate Action Plan that he issued last June, he laid out a comprehensive roadmap to cut carbon pollution in America, to prepare America's communities for the impacts of climate change that we can no longer avoid, and to lead global efforts to address global climate change. The plan includes important measures, many of which are already in development or underway, to ensure a secure and reliable electricity grid for Americans in a changing energy landscape. So it's particularly gratifying to see industry collaborate on this endeavor, including in the crucial area of standards. Standards for power outage and restoration data help ensure that first responders, public health officials, and the general public have the energy-related information that they need to have at their fingertips. Standards can reduce the risk that sizable public and private investments will become obsolete prematurely. And standards are at the heart of the Green Button Initiative launched in 2012 by the Obama administration in partnership with the electric utility industry. Green Button provides families and businesses with easy and secure access to their own energy use information using consensus-based industry standards. Including the seven utilities that announced their new commitments to Green Button today, 55 utilities and electricity suppliers serving more than 61 million homes and businesses have committed to enable their customers with green button access to help save them energy and shrink their energy bills. That means more than 100 million Americans now have access to their own green button data and the opportunity to use new private sector tools and services like some of the ones being demonstrated here today and that is a really big impact. So let me stop there and introduce you to my good friend and close colleague the Secretary of Energy, Dr. Ernie Meniz, who will say more about why the kinds of efforts you are undertaking are foundational to our progress toward a clean, secure, and sustainable energy future. Um, I can't say enough about, um, about Ernie Meniz. He has um, had such an extraordinary background that suits him to be Secretary of Energy. I think he's probably the best qualified Secretary of Energy we've ever had, and he's burning up the track over there at DOE, so it is a great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Ernie Meniz. It's, it's, it's really great to, to keep working with uh, John Holdren. We've been working together for a long time with every permutation of one or the other or both of us in government uh, or out of government, and right now, obviously, we're both in, and uh, uh, John and I have worked together on energy uh, and uh, on nuclear security issues for a couple of decades at least, so it's, it's been great. And I have to say, John has done a terrific job, which I saw when I was serving on the President's uh, PCAST committee uh, uh, earlier in the administration, uh, and uh, uh, the President's deep, and deep engagement in science and technology, of course, helps, but John has done a, done a tremendous job in, uh, in, uh, in having the, the President uh, 
strongly engaged in, in, these, in, these, in these issues. And of course now uh, we both have uh, responsibility for uh, helping move along the President's climate agenda uh, as, a, as a very, very strong uh, uh, priority. Uh, the uh, clean energy is obviously a big part of that uh, in terms of mitigation and the energy data palooza is part of that. So uh, really, really pleased to, uh, to, uh, to be here. Uh, clearly, we understand that uh, at DOE and, and the administration that uh, working with the private sector uh, as partners uh, is critical if we are, in fact, to achieve our uh, energy environment objectives uh, through, uh, through innovation. Uh, and, um, and I know today, uh, particularly the focus on, on data and IT and software uh, is a very, very important part of, of the transformation that we are, that, that we are looking for. Uh, so we, want, we will continue to work, work with you and obviously the subject of, of a lot of what you've been doing uh, today uh, in terms of uh, open data, open tools, uh, open, source, uh, open source software. And in fact today, let me just summarize a few of the things that, uh, that DOE uh, has underway in using uh, big data, maybe not so big data, uh, in, uh, in supporting uh, private sector uh, uh, innovation uh, to, uh, to advance uh, clean energy. Uh, it's, uh, I've been called in this town as a, a data-driven uh, cabinet member. That's not always said as a positive thing in some of the circles I travel in, but, uh, but we do think it's actually quite, uh, uh, quite important. But as you know, the issue is not just compiling data, uh, but it's also making it uh, uh, accessible, uh, usable, uh, uh, protecting sensitive data uh, while one is doing that. Uh, so, uh, so making you know making open data uh, again, you all know, easy to find, widely available wherever possible, uh, is 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 critical. And again, even as we uh, work to protect uh, data that uh, that that needs that needs to be. Uh, so, uh, but you know, we will continue to be driven by the philosophy that freely available uh, government uh, data, certainly about energy, uh, is an important national resource and, uh, and important uh, to many of you uh, to help you uh, in your, uh, in your uh, innovation. So um, let me talk about some of the progress uh, that we are making and some of the directions we're, uh, we're, we're going in. Uh, again, as you know, we're certainly working to inventory uh, our data resources uh, and tools across the department, uh, engaging with, uh, with the private sector about improving uh, our data assets uh, through challenges, codathons, brainstorming workshops, and, uh, and much more. Uh, we're big supporters of the Energy Data Initiative and the Climate Data Initiative, which are both multi-agency efforts uh, to, uh, to organize and liberate uh, energy and climate data uh, for, for beneficial use. Uh, now, clearly, we have to keep the momentum going and uh, for example, so today uh, uh, we're announcing uh, that our uh, buildings performance database has reached a milestone of three quarters of a million buildings, uh, making it the world's largest uh, public database on actual energy use uh, and, uh, and building characteristics. So I, we think it's, it is, it, you know, it's out there enabling uh, uh, benchmarking of building energy performance uh, uh, as was not possible uh, only a few years ago, really. And, uh, and is helping energy managers to understand the most promising energy efficiency uh, retrofits uh, uh, that uh, will get them a big, big bang for the buck. Uh, also announcing uh, the National Geothermal Data System, accessible to the public. Its geoscience raw data can pinpoint geothermal sweet spots uh, for researchers and developers, uh, and hopefully will help drive uh, our engineered geothermal uh, uh, opportunities to, uh, to, to full potential. Uh, uh, we also released a detailed data on untapped hydropower potential uh, across, across the United States to identify the most promising sites uh, for this form of clean energy, clean energy and, and, and we think that there are the order of, uh, you know, certainly 65 gigawatts or so uh, of, of, of opportunity with micro hydro and, and other uh, forms of, 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 uh, of hydro. The, um, in, in the solar regime, uh, we, we've known for a long time that uh, particularly as, as costs go down uh, for, uh, for solar modules and, uh, and we can really say we are at or below uh, a, dollar, a dollar a watt, uh, that the, so a lot of the soft costs uh, are now uh, 
uh, part of the issue, especially for uh, distributed uh, solar. So our Solar Energy uh, Technologies Office uh, is, is launching the SunShot uh, Catalyst Initiative, a contest uh, which any team, in which any team can propose uh, software solutions uh, to challenges as defined uh, by, by industry. Uh, we'll provide some uh, uh, prize winners with some funding to uh, get to the prototype stage. Uh, uh, in fact, with the follow-on prizes of up to $100,000 uh, for advancing these solutions toward, uh, toward market. Um, there are a host of data initiatives at DOE uh, besides these that I've just described, uh, uh, many under the umbrella of our American Energy Data Challenge. It's all about harnessing uh, ingenuity uh, of many of you and, and, your, and, your, and your colleagues, uh, again, for a cleaner and more efficient economy. And to keep going, again, today uh, we're announcing uh, the third chapter of this American Energy Data Challenge uh, called the Open Data by Design Contest. Uh, this challenge uh, invites the public uh, to make uh, DOE's energy data resources more, more accessible, uh, more usable, more valuable, and we want the best designers and developers uh, across the country to really help us unlock the value of our public data uh, resources. So this competition will formally open uh, uh, to the public uh, in, in one week on, on June 4th next week. So keep, keep your eye out for that. Our Apps for Energy contest has, has challenged uh, software developers to build innovative applications. And we held five regional hackathons across the country. Uh, and the submissions have been great. Over 3,500 people uh, took, took part. Um, it wasn't easy to down select, but we did select four finalists and from them uh, a second and first place winner. So our, um, and it's time to announce them. Uh, our Apps for Energy finalists are in alphabetical order. Uh, E-Light Power Use Planner with Green Button Usage Data. Very catchy name. Uh, NACT, uh, which uses uh, uh, your own data to show efficiency investments and financing options. The third is uh, How Clean Is Your Shirt? Uh, by Powerhouse, which shows 7th and 8th graders uh, why doing laundry off-peak matters. And fourth, and What Buddy, uh, which shows your energy uses, usage educates you and lets you evaluate electricity providers. So, the winners. Second prize uh, in the Apps for Energy contest is uh, E-Lite Power Use Planner with Green Button Data. Congratulations. Maybe you should stand up. <laughs> Where? There you are. Okay. <laughs> And uh, we'll be able to give you your, uh, your certificates in the, in the showcase uh, coming up. And the grand prize uh, is what, buddy? Stand up. Where are you? <laughs> oh, there we go. Oh. All sitting together. <laughs> so again, so what, buddy, uh, lets you use uh, green button data uh, from, uh, from, the, from the utility on, on your smartphone, uh, showing usage uh, graphically, helping you find places to save energy and money. What Buddy will also let you evaluate competitive electricity supply offers with the same app for users uh, in, in, different, in different states. So uh, I'd like actually, again, the, the two winners, but also the other two finalists to all please stand up so that we can, uh, we can congratulate the whole, uh, all, all four of them. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> They are, they are clustered down here in the, in the front. Uh, so uh, anyway, so that, those are uh, some, of the, uh, some of the things that the DUE and, and of course the President uh, are, are, are looking at in terms of uh, data-driven energy solutions uh, for what really is uh, the central problem of our time, uh, climate change, um, uh, and of course working to try to get private sector innovation uh, as an essential uh, part of the solution to that climate, climate challenge. Uh, we're going to need all hands on deck uh, to, uh, to approach both the mitigation and, uh, and adaptation challenges of climate. Uh, you've all seen the, the, recent, uh, the recent assessment, uh, assessment document following IPCC reports. And so all that we can do, uh, particularly in driving uh, uh, renewable energy, efficiency, and grid investments uh, uh, is, is critical. And of course, those were the subjects uh, of today's uh, lightning, lightning uh, presentations. 
So we're going to look forward to, uh, to working uh, together with you uh, uh, on these um, uh, data-driven uh, initiatives. Uh, uh, again, uh, uh, very, very critical to what, to what we are doing. Uh, and uh, I look forward right now to heading to the showcase and to getting to uh, see uh, some of these, not only the winners, but uh, other, uh, other, other projects and uh, having a chance to, uh, to meet with you as well. So thank you, thank you very much.